thank you all so much for joining us this evening for The Remarkable Life of Ann Sullivan. Author Kim Nielsen will discuss her book, Beyond the Miracle Worker, The Remarkable Life of Ann Sullivan Macy and her extraordinary friendship with Helen Keller on the eve of Ann Sullivan's birthday. So Kim is a professor of disability studies, history and women's and gender studies at the University of Toledo. Since earning her PhD in history from the University of Iowa, uh, Kim's scholarship uh, has centered on historical debates about who is fit to participate in civic life uh, using gender, disability, and changing notions of competency as her tools of analysis. Uh, a Disability History of the United States, Kim's latest book is the first analysis of disability through United States history and covers the period prior to European arrival through the present. Other books include uh, the previously aforementioned uh, Beyond the Miracle Worker, uh, as well as Helen Keller's Selected Writings, The Radical Lives of Helen Keller, and Un-American Womanhood, Anti-Radicalism, Anti-Feminism, and The First Red Scare. Again, want to thank the Friends of the Library, the six other partnering libraries, the Mass Center for the Book, and the Public Health Museum for helping spread the word. Uh, so all uh, 75 of us or so, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Kim for joining us here tonight. And Kim, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Oh, thank you, Robert. I think I'm going to hire you as my publicist. This is great. Um, I also want to thank everybody out there and the citizens of Tewksbury and just libraries in general, which I can't imagine my life without them at any point in time. So I appreciate that. Um, as Robert said, I am um, a scholar of Keller and Sullivan, and I thought I'd just start by why I wrote about Sullivan. So I had written two books on Keller, put the topic down, swore I would never talk about anything pertaining to Helen Keller ever again. And of course, life intervenes, right? And I began to, you know, start it on a different book, but begin to think about Ann Sullivan Macy and realize that you know, like an old country song, I'd done a wrong, um, that I had not taken her seriously as an individual. And I, I, I don't think at that point, I think very few people had both during her lifetime and afterwards. And so I went back to the topic that I thought I would never do anything pertaining to Helen Keller and wrote about Ann Sullivan Macy. And I, I'm gonna give you a little bit of her life and then talk about sort of my analysis of her. Um, I think she's an incredibly interesting person. So Anne Sullivan was born in 1866, April 14, that's tomorrow, baptized almost immediately. She's the child of Irish immigrants um, and spent her first about 10 years or so, eight years in Agua, Massachusetts. Her family was incredibly poor. Um, probably at the time of her birth, her mother already had tuberculosis, which at that point was really a, a death sentence and a long, ugly death sentence. Her mother died at 1874 when she was eight years old. At that point, two of Anne's siblings had already died. Only three of them were remaining. She herself, Annie, had trachoma, which is a disease of the eye that today is very easily resolved with antibiotics. But at that point in time, before antibiotics, it was a quite painful, really debilitating disease. Um, in trachoma, it's almost as though sandpaper grows underneath your eyelids. And so every time you blink your eyes, there's a, a scratchy um, abrasion going over your eyeballs. It could be very um, painful. It caused debilitating vision loss that would slowly change over time. At this point, the almost only treatment for trachoma was in essence for a doctor to peel, I don't wanna gross you all out, but a doctor to peel open the eyelid and scrape some of the abrasions off with um, a razor blade. So this is a really difficult, painful, not pleasant disease she lived with. Um, she was just eight. Her brother, Jimmy, was five years old. He had some sort of hip disability that caused mobility problems. Um, and her baby sister, Mary, was just over one year old. So her father, who was a farmhand, illiterate, had three children that he was attempting to raise. And that didn't go well. Um, we don't know a lot about this, but it sounds as though her father drank quite a bit. He sent them to family. Family members found raising Annie and Jimmy with their disabilities to be very difficult. And within two years, the children, the two children, were sent to the Tewksbury Alms House. Um, the youngest daughter was taken in by a family member. And the two, it's, it's hard for us to imagine today what an almshouse, 19th century almshouse was. 
Annie and Jimmy arrived there in April of, or excuse me, February of 1876. And an almshouse at this point in time was really a, a catch-all institution, particularly um, away from major cities, but a, a catch-all institution in which, in this case, orphans, adults with disabilities, poor women who were um, single and pregnant, um, elderly people who did not have others to care for them but needed that. Um, all kinds of folks were simply warehoused at the almshouse. And there were children there. Um, as I said, some orphans, sometimes children were born at the almshouse, but all almshouses had children in them, almost all of them alone without adults in their lives. Um, Jimmy died within a few months and Annie stayed there for about four years. Um, while there, she had, it's, it's estimated about five different eye surgeries. We know of five. Um, so her eyesight was very variable. Her pain levels were very variable. Um, we know that she had a very strong community of women who cared for her, often told her stories about their lives, you know, perhaps not all of them stories that an eight-year-old should have heard, but stories about their lives. And when she wrote about this period, she always wrote about stories, um, novels that an, an older woman read to her, um, some periods of time where she would read to others when her eyesight was good enough, but that was pretty variable. And then just women who told her stories about their lives. And, you know, she hinted in later writings that she learned a lot about sex, learned a lot about romance, learned a lot about violence. Um, she intimated um, various traumas that happened there. There are ways in which this was a really awful place. Um, other than a division between men and women, male and female, there was very other little um, guidance in the institution. Children were not kept apart from adults. Um, people with all kinds of conditions were kept to other with, with each other. I suspect that trachoma was throughout the institution, any um, transmissible disease was. She left Perkin, or excuse me, she left Tewksbury in 1880. And there's a lot of mythology about this. But what we do know is that Franklin Sanborn the head of the Massachusetts State Board of Charities came through Tewksbury, which he did, you know, about once a year. Um, and Annie always wrote that she could tell when they were coming because someone would clean out the toilet areas um, and make it smell better. But Sanborn had come through like he always did to inspect the place. Um, and at least per the stories, Anne desperately wanted an education and she desperately wanted out of there. And, you know, and this accords with her personality in later life, but Apparently she went up to Sanborn, somehow she you know, scooched her way in and pulled on his sleeve and basically said, I'd like to go to school, please, I'd like to go to school. Um, imagine this is you know, a child at this point, um, about 14 years old, 13, 14 years old. Um, she'd not had incredibly well nourishment. Um, she was there as an orphan. I assume that her eyes were likely swollen, perhaps red. Um, but he eventually sent, he decided to help her and sent her to Perkins School for the Blind. Perkins in Boston was um, a really stellar institution or at least world famous at this point and a leading educational institution for blind people in the United States and was known internationally. Um, and she, Annie spent about six years there at Perkins going to school. Um, and she wrote, I just wanted to read a little bit to you. I had desired immensely to go to school. I was ambitious to speak like educated people. I wanted to wear clothes like the fashion plates Jimmy and I had painted upon the walls of the death house. Above all, I wanted to forget that I had spent six years of my childhood in an almshouse. And yet when I was put in the way of achieving these things, something within me fought against them. My mind had unconsciously absorbed the almshouse point of view. My thoughts were dyed in its dark colors. A psychoanalyst would say I had developed an inferiority complex. Perhaps I had. It is an easier way of explaining a difficult mental phenomenon. I think these years, it is impossible to exaggerate the impact of these years upon her life. Um, there are ways in which she loved it. She loved learning. She loved a community. She loved safety. She loved adequate food, shelter, clothing, 
warmth in the winter. Um, and she loved to learn. At the same time, however, she knew she was distinctly different than the other students. Um, most of them were, I, were blind. And she you know, certainly had limited vision at times in her life. In times she was there, she could hardly see. But at other times after surgeries, her eyes were white. Um, she could see quite well. She told really funny stories actually of um, going to the classroom um, and, and indicating to her teachers that her eyesight was very poor when it was not and pulling tricks on them. Also, while she was at Perkins, she had two more eye surgeries. And I want you to think about what this meant to have surgery in the 1880s, 1870s. Um, anesthesia was fairly unpredictable. Um, cleanliness was um, variable. Um, these were sometimes life-threatening surgeries and um, could be very difficult. And she was just a kid this whole time. Also, while she was at Perkins, she's, there's a, a couple months period in which she continually snuck out of school. And this was when the state government was holding hearings on Tewksbury. It had come out that there were um, inequalities going on, that there were selling of bodies out of the Tewksbury Cemetery, that there was the stealing of food, stealing of the goods of inmates. Um, and this was well documented in the newspapers about these hearings. And we know that Anne snuck out of school and went down to the hearings and listened for many, many days in a row. And often what it, what it was like to hear about the selling of bodies out of the cemetery, for her to wonder if her brother Jimmy's body was still there, if it had been stolen, if it had been sold. They were often, they were sold to medical students. Um, and she just didn't know what had happened. During her time at Perkins, despite her feeling of any e unease um, of not fitting in, she came out valedictorian. She was um, in her year, the only charity student. Other students had money to pay their way. They had families, they had support structures. She did not. After graduating as the valedictorian, she, you know, as the valedictorian was supposed to go on and do great things. And everyone else had families to go to families to return to after graduation, and she had no one. She could not find employment. Um, and I think this was a really low moment in her life. You know, up till now, she had experienced nearly lifelong physical pain. She continued with that. She had experienced trauma. Um, she knew she loved spoken and written stories, but she was very terrified about her future. She did not know um, how she would support herself. 1886, there were a lot, a lot, there were not a lot of employment opportunities for young women. And she did not know what she was going to do. She continued to live at Perkins, uh, largely because she didn't have anywhere else to go. And they did not want to kick her out. It is in March of 1887. So probably it was about nine months after graduation when um, Helen Keller's parents wrote to Perkins looking for a governess that Perkins would send down to Tuscumbia, Alabama. Um, the leaders at Perkins knew that Anne needed a job. They could tell Helen Keller's parents that this was their valedictorian. Um, I don't think P Keller's parents quite understood about Anne's disability. And certainly the people at Perkins did not talk about in their letters. Um, but Anne Sullivan Macy ended up accepting a job to be governess and taking the train. It's about a week after another eye surgery. It's reported she still had bandages that she took the train, the segregated train from Boston to Tuscumbia, Alabama, um, and arrived only 14 years older than Helen Keller. She was about 20, Annie was about 21 at that point. Um, to her seven-year-old student. Um, th there was, it seems, a lot of discord between Keller, excuse me, the Keller family and Annie at first. Um, Anne was and considered herself a staunch unionist, a staunch northerner. She had a lot of disdain for the um, former Confederacy, for the family of Keller, who was, um, their family had been a slave-owning family. Um, and Anne was very hostile to that. So it sounds like there were quite some fiery conversations. 
and excuse me, my cat is annoying, is meowing. You're just gonna have to put up with that. I hope that's not too bothersome. Um, but Anne had remarkable success educating Keller. And um, well, originally she had been encouraged and basically told to copy the teaching methods used at Perkins. And the teaching methods used at Perkins for another deaf blind student named um, Laura Bridgman. Keller, excuse me, Ann Sullivan quickly gave up on those teaching methods and she found them not effective. She didn't know what she was gonna do. She wrote later that she had begun to watch the way that women mothers talked with their children. That even before children could talk, children could converse, that mothers would talk to them using regular language. And so Ann decided to simply try that. And she communicated with Keller um, fingerspelling but in a simple conversational tone. And even though Helen did not understand at that point, Anne persisted with that. Um, and by January, so you know, within a year, um, the two were doing quite well at figure spelling communication. Perkins seized on that and publicized the success and claimed credit for it, which um, clearly angered Anne. Um, but Perkins, claimed success for it, that Anne was adopting its own methods. By January of 1888, I said about nine months later, Perkins and Helen Keller was world famous. Um, Anne was not. She was simply considered to be the aid that Perkins had provided um, to teach young Helen Keller. And at this point, I think there are a lot of questions for Anne Sullivan was, and about Anne Sullivan. Was she simply a governess? following the wise men from Perkins who had um, instructed her? Was she a teacher herself? Um, what was she to be? Well, in the next years, Keller continued with her um, scholarly life and Anne was always with her, participating in that. The two, um, the child and the teacher first went to Perkins. They then went to a school in New York eventually to Boston's Chamberlain School for Young Ladies, actually in Cambridge, very close to Radcliffe, the female counterpart to Harvard. Um, and these you know, next 10 or so years were years in which Anne Sullivan really battled a variety of male educators um, for the credit for educating Keller, for the um, control of Keller's education, even in making decisions about where the two women would live, what kind of um, clothing they would wear, um, what religious practices they would have, who would make decisions about Keller's education. And throughout it all, Ann Sullivan Macy continued to have episodic pain, variable eyesight, continued eye surgeries, and tumultuous emotions. The two started at Radcliffe, Keller as a student and as a, a reader in essence of materials in 1900. And they were there for about five years. Keller did four years at Radcliffe and then graduated. And Sullivan continued, attended all the classes, um, interpreting, fingerspelling the classroom materials into Keller's hand. Um, after school, of course, they would do all the reading together again, and Sullivan doing the reading, fingerspelling that into Keller's hand. Um, throughout this, Anne had a lot of physical pain. The more reading she did, um, the more her eyes hurt. Um, it's, Keller was honest later that she often lied about whether or not she understood the material and wanted to hear it again so that um, her teacher would not have to reread the material when Anne's eyes were very sore. And you see here how I think the relationship between the two women, particularly as Keller reached adulthood, began to change. Um, ways in which Keller took care of Anne. There were occasionally other people who could do the finger spelling with Keller. Um, they often tended to be slower. They did not have you know, 10, 15 years of experience um, as the two women did. They did not have the shorthand that the two women had. Um, a young man named James Ma John Macy occasionally helped. There were other students who did as well. And Keller graduated then in 1904, already the author of an international bestseller um, and you know, ready to change the world and, and make a difference. When Keller graduated in 1984, or excuse me, 1984, 1904, there was again this question of what would happen to Anne Sullivan Macy. 
Keller had graduated college. Was Annie now done as a teacher? Was she done as an aide? Was she done as a, um, someone who followed the instructions of Perkins? What would happen to her? The two women stayed together. Um, they purchased a home and rent them. Throughout this last couple of years, John Macy, the English tutor, had been courting Anne Sullivan Macy. And the two married in 1905 after he'd spent a year apparently repeatedly asking her to marry him. Um, we know that Anne was thinking about her child at, at this time. She had long relied on a man named John Hitz, who was a, um, a friend of Keller's, um, an elderly man who worked with the National Geographic Society. And um, with him, she made an inc incognito visit to Agawam and visited um, the place where she had grown up. Her mother had died. She visited her mother's gravesite. She apparently walked by several times the home where her sister lived, um, but never knocked on the door, never identified herself. So we know she was thinking about her childhood um, as she reached adulthood and as she married John Macy. The marriage is very difficult. By 1909, there were already problems in the marriage. And I always think this is so fascinating by looking at the census. In 1910, the three people, John, Annie, and Helen, were all living at Rentham. John was listed in the census as the head of the household. Annie was listed as the wife. And Helen was listed as the boarder, okay, someone who boarded in the household. By 1920, when Helen Keller had firmly established herself in fame and traveled around the world and the nation, Helen Keller was listed as the head of the household in the census. Annie was listed as teacher and John was listed as a boarder or lodger in the house. It's during these years that the Macy marriage really fell apart. And this was clearly very painful to Anne Sullivan Macy. Um, by 1913, they were um, pretty permanently separated, although Annie refused to ever give him a divorce. And so they remained married until um, both of them died. During these years, Helen and Anne traveled quite a bit on the lecture circuit. Keller loved this. Anne Sullivan Macy really didn't like this. She continued to have a lot of physical pain, um, variable eyesight. In, it's estimated about 1914, 1915, she, it became clear, had tuberculosis, the disease that had killed her mother. Um, and she sought treatment first in Lake Placid. She then actually went to Puerto Rico for several months. During this entire time, Keller was with her family. Um, and Annie thought she was gonna die. Everyone thought she was gonna die. Um, she stayed for several months in Puerto Rico, thinking she might die while she was there, um, and wrote to Keller. So this is a time where for Anne Sullivan Macy, her marriage had fallen apart. She had no idea what was going to happen. She thought she was going to die because of tuberculosis, the disease that had killed her mother. And she and Keller were struggling to make a living. They how they made a living at this point was by traveling around the US and Keller spoke on the vaudeville circuit and the lecture circuit. As I said, this was something that Keller really enjoyed and Macy never liked. I think um, the physical pain she was in, the variable eyesight, um, it made traveling really difficult for her. The two also traveled to Scotland and this became a lifelong pattern for both women. Life was hard. This is something you can do when you have some resources. What would they do? They would leave the country. Um, hiding out in Scotland or France. The 20s continued to be a really difficult time for Anne Sullivan Macy. Um, she had one eye removed due to, a cat, due to cataracts. Um, her, in her remaining eye, she continued to have trachoma problems. The two traveled quite a bit. They began to work for the American Foundation for the Blind. Um, I say they, um, Helen was the one who was hired, but Anne was always part of the deal. They traveled quite a bit, as I said, but Anne's eyes um, continued to give her problems. It's sometime in here that she likely had a hysterectomy. Um, she had a major surgery, which was not talked about in great detail, but um, there's evidence that hints it was a hysterectomy. And in 1913, you see, she continued to think about her husband, John, 
excuse me, and in 1930, John published a book called About Women. And um, it's a fascinating book in which John argued that women's going influence society in society was leading to a downfall in society. Um, John argued that there was a problem that quote, certain kinds of women, egregiously assertive feminists and women who pay men the doubtful compliment of imitating them and interfering women who try to run the whole show and reform the male actors. This he said was the big problem in the United States. And we know that Annie read this book. She had actually arranged, she heard of it coming out. She had arranged to have it sent to her in Scotland as soon as it was published. Um, she read it and she was not happy. Um, she felt it was a explicitly targeted her um, and attacked her and Keller without naming them for their participation in John's life. Another thing that really annoyed her about the book is that John had a list of praiseworthy women in the US, in US history, and he listed Julia Ward Howe. Um, Julia Ward Howe was the wife of Samuel Gridley Howe who'd been very famous at Perkins. Julie Ward Howe also, is, of course, is also known as a suffragist. Um, and she was someone with whom Keller argued constantly at Perkins. The two, excuse me, with Annie argued constantly at Perkins. Annie did not like Julie Ward Howe. She apparently, as a student, mouthed off to her many times. She, um, felt that Julia Ward Howe had tried to protect Samuel Gridley Howe's memory by claiming credit um, for Annie's education of Helen Keller. Um, but the two women did not get along and John had listed her as one of the praiseworthy women and Annie always felt that this was one of the you know, final kicks that John gave her after they had separated. And it's um, very, just a few years after that, that John died and Annie always wrote about that as a, a very difficult time too. During the last 10 years of Anne Sullivan Macy's life, is a period that's really fascinating to me because this is a period in which it's very clear that Helen Keller served as Anne Sullivan Macy's personal aide. Now, the stereotype about disability and about Keller, of course, is that Keller was deaf blind. She sort of trumped everything with disability. Um, but this is a period in which Keller served as Anne Sullivan Macy's aide. Um, there are wonderful letters. Um, this was a period in which Annie was largely in bed or lying on the couch. And there are letters that Annie wrote. And I say wrote in um, scare quotes because Annie would actually fingerspell the letters to Helen Keller. Then Helen Keller would type the letter, the words that Annie wanted um, to whomever Annie was writing to. And what I love about them is that very often they are in Annie's tone of voice. Then there's a parenthetical parentheses. And then Helen Keller would make some sort of snide or disagreeing remark about what Annie was saying. Then the other end of the parentheses would go up and then it would continue again in Annie's tone. Um, and we see how the two women disagreed, but also how they relied upon one another. But Keller very much was Annie's aide in this period, both in this personal communication and in, from what we can tell, nearly every other aspect of her life. But these last 10 years were years of a lot of physical pain. Um, increasingly, Annie had no eyesight. Um, it was a period in which she she described herself as very melancholy. And I hesitate to use the word depression, which today we think of as a clinical word in that this was not a, a diagnosis that existed at the time. Anne used the word sad. She used the word melancholy. She used the word morose. Um, but it was a, clearly a period in which she really struggled emotionally. And she died in 1936. Um, and Keller really was devastated for um, several years. When I think about Anne Sullivan Macy and her life, there's a few things I really would like to emphasize. Anne Sullivan Macy is remembered as the teacher, the capital level T teacher of Helen Keller. Um, but Anne Sullivan Macy was a woman with a disability 
And I think that she experienced her disability as far more debilitating, um, a much more significant impairment than Helen Keller ever experienced hers. Anne had physical pain, um, nearly lifelong. She had variable and ever-changing levels of vision. She was blind, she was sighted, she was something in between. She had childhood traumas. She had self-doubt, she had sadness. And Ellie, she experienced this as much more significant impairment than Helen Keller ever did. There's also the case, I think, that you know, her status was as teacher. And for many people, they assumed that a teacher had to be able-bodied. And that precluded other people from acknowledging Ann Sullivan Macy's blindness and disability. Um, even when people knew she had come from Perkins as a student, her own visual impairment was largely ignored by others. And so even when it was obvious, even if she had insisted upon it, other people largely um, did not acknowledge it. I also think the relationship between the, the two women is really fascinating. Regarding disability, um, Anne Sullivan Macy never learned Braille. And I'm always struck by that because Helen loved Braille. She used it a lot. Helen found Braille to be very liberating. And Anne never even attempted to learn Braille from what we can figure out. And I always want to know what was behind that, um, particularly because Annie loved to read. She loved stories. We know that Anne really encouraged Helen to be whatever she wanted, to do what she wanted, to not be limited. And yet, I think Anne found her, her own disability to be fairly limiting, um, despite her, her real lifelong success. The two women also disagreed about religion. Um, Helen was a devout Christian who followed the path of Emanuel Swedenborg. Um, it's a, a Protestant tradition, very spiritualist. And um, Annie um, always said that she did not believe in a God. I think the two women were also very different in sentiment and personality. Um, Helen was incredibly, almost endlessly cheerful. I think annoyingly cheerful at times. Annie was not. Um, I suspect Anne Sullivan Macy could be sar quite sarcastic and had a real funny, biting sense of humor, a wicked sense of humor, if I can pretend to be. I'm from Massachusetts. Um, Helen was a, a much more, I think, gracious, patient human being. Near the end of her life, Anne attempted to write her own life story. Um, she wrote a document in which much was destroyed. We know that she burnt many personal materials. I really struggled with the remaining materials in that there are times when she would write maybe 10 different versions of the same event and all of them slightly different. She also wrote materials um, sort, of, sort of incognito. Um, she wrote about a, a young woman named Joanna, which was her own middle name. Um, who went to an almshouse called Dukesbury, not Tewkesbury, but Dukesbury with a D. Um, and again, with multiple versions of the same events. We also know that at least per Helen and Annie, Annie did not share information about Tewkesbury with Helen Keller until 1930, after the women had been together for 42 years. Her years at Tewkesbury were Something she experienced is very shameful. I think the poverty, the orphan status, the possible traumas she likely went through at Tewkesbury. And this is what Helen wrote about it. Her Helen, Annie sent away the maid and the dog even for the afternoon. The two friends sat quote side by side and quote, the terrifying drama of her early years began to unfold in my palm pouring out a tale of a tragic childhood spent among human beings sunk in misery, degradation, and disease. Helen wrote, I put myself into the exploring spirit of the half-blind, lonely child who lived in that hideous environment, and I nearly went distracted at the dreadful sobbing with which, after the silence of half a century, she spoke of her brother Jimmy's death in the almshouse. So it was not until Anne was 64 years old and the two women had been together, as I said, for 42 years that Annie even told Helen about Tewksbury, Jimmy, and all of her experiences there. 
Helen also referred to sort of vague, unspecified secrets about Tewksbury that they never made public. I think I would have liked Anne Sullivan Macy. Um, she was analytical. She was a bit sarcastic. She loved to have fun. Um, I find Helen Kelver sometimes a little bit uh, annoyingly cheerful. Um, Annie is complicated. She did not live a charmed life. I think that what she had in life, she made, she forged, she fought for a life that made her happy, that challenged her. Um, and she, she did so, she was able to make a life um, and a life that despite a lot of difficulties, I think it was a life that gave her a lot of happiness and um, satisfaction. And much of that was due to the vocation she found, the cause she found um, in Helen Keller and the emotional support that Helen Keller provided to her throughout her life. Um, the two women, I think really exemplify what interdependence meant and what interdependence means and what friendship can mean. Um, I would love to answer any questions you have about Annie. Um, I do wanna point out perhaps um, the, the cover to my book, Beyond the Miracle Worker, the image, this is a photo that was found in an attic um, for the very first time while I was writing the book. And it's an, an image of Helen in a chair holding a doll at you know, eight or nine years old and Annie looking at her. And I, I love what the artists were able to do who put together the cover because they slightly blurred Helen and so that Annie stands out in this image. And I like that because so much of um, throughout Annie's life, Keller very much it came to dominate her. And in our memory of Annie, um, Helen has come to dominate. Um, but I, I love the way that in this image, at least Helen, the child is blurred and Annie is made clear and the focus remains on her. So thank you very much. And I look forward to talking and responding to questions. So wonderful job, uh, Kim, as expected. Uh, so folks, we have a uh, time for about 15 minutes of questions. If anyone, I mean, Kim is like the definitive biographer of uh, Ann Sullivan here. So uh, if anyone has any uh, Ann Sullivan questions, uh, this is uh, certainly the time to ask them. Uh, Colleen wants to know, what did Ann Sullivan die of? The doctor's reports are actually a little iffy, but it's she had um, septic poisoning at some point that she had acquired in the hospital. She um, had um, unspecified continued eye pain in her one eye, and there's there's speculation that that became infected and spread throughout her body. She became increasingly weaker. It's likely she also experienced a stroke in the last week or so of her life. Uh, DL asks, do you know what was the cause of the conflict between Ann Sullivan and John Macy? I suspect like every relationship falling apart, it was really complicated and multifaceted. Um, he did, it is, there's evidence that he drank a lot, which is something her father did. And I suspect that she really did not like that. Um, he also found it increasingly hard to make money and she and Keller were making money and increasingly became the successful professional figures. Well, John's career was falling apart in this period. Um, so I, I think that there were some sort of gender tensions there that um, were difficult sometimes for them to figure out in um, a period where patriarchal households were the expectation. Uh, so she was about 15 years older than him too, and she really struggled with that. Uh, Georgia asks, was Ann Sullivan's sister aware of who she was? I, there's really iffy evidence about this and there's, like a tiny, tiny bit of evidence that the two women met um, in the last about 15 years of Ann Sullivan Macy's life. But the documentation on that is really iffy and it's not clear. So um, I'm not sure. I actually have tried to trace all this down and be in contact with um, descendants and I haven't had any luck. Um, there's some undocumented writing by, you know, various folks in the last 25 years that about the meeting, but no one's been able to provide like I'm a historian, I like footnotes. Like why, where'd you find that? What's up? Um, and no one's done that. 
Uh, Paul asks, is it true that a famous author gave Annie the nickname, the miracle worker? My understanding is that this came from the um, screen script and film um, that um, was put together by Arthur Penn and somebody else whose name is not gonna, I always, can I confess, I'm always afraid that I'll go on Jeopardy and forget the most basic things about US history. And this is like that. Um, but Arthur Penn and one other person put together the screenplay and film that later became The Miracle Worker. And I um, think my memory is that that is where the phrase came from. Annie did not like it at all. Although she, actually she was dead by then. She would not have liked it, how's that? Uh, speaking of dead, uh, Katie wants to know, when did Helen die? in 1968 not that long ago i was alive then she's buried in the national cathedral both women are buried in the national cathedral um if anyone is interested uh, angela asks do you know why anne wouldn't give her husband a divorce when the marriage fell apart yeah you know i th again i think any the, the decline of any relationship is really complicated um I think the married status was very important to Anne. She continued to be called Mrs. Macy in public until she died. And that Mrs. title was very important to her. Um, certainly she could have kept that after a divorce, but the scandal of a divorce was not something she wanted. She did not want to be known as a divorced woman. Um, and the, the disreputability that would have come with that in the teens, 20s and 30s was not what she wanted. Um, you know, there's also a lot of evidence that despite the, the discord in the marriage, she continued to care for John. I think the falling apart of the relationship really pained her. And um, he actually became connected with, he ended up living with another woman after their marriage had fallen apart. It was you know, long after they had separated um, and had a child with her. And during that entire time, Anne refused to go along with the divorce. Uh, Cheryl asks, did Anne have any pregnancies during her marriage? That's a good question. None that are documented. Um, like I said, there is, we don't know what um, precipitated the likely hysterectomy, um, but we don't know of any pregnancies. And Annie would have been, if I'm doing my math right, um, she would have, she was a, over 40 um, when they married. Although, you know, that's young. Can I say that at 56? 40 is dang young. Uh, Colette asks, do you have any information or reflections about the meetings uh, in the relationship between Annie, Helen, and Maria Montessori? You know, other than some basic stuff that they met and communicated some, some letters, I really don't. Um, Annie and Helen had an incredible epistemological letter exchange. They wrote to so many people. They received so many letters. Um, and lots of educators from around the globe communicated with both of them. Um, and, and clearly there is that exchange, but I don't know much more about that other than that it existed. And I've read those letters and they, don't, they did not jump out to me. Um, so I suspect they were very similar to the letters that they had with other educators. So uh, Wendy, I promised to get to your question. It's like five questions in one. So I'm gonna skip that for now. Um, Colleen asks, did Helen Keller have any romantic interests? She did. Um, and I always, I'm, you know, it strikes me as sad. So in 19, 1915, um, at the time when the Macy marriage was falling apart, when Annie, this is like a soap opera, the Macy marriage was falling apart, Annie thought she was dying of tuberculosis. Um, Keller had um, infuriated much of her family by giving some money to the NAACP. Um, during those, that year or so, um, there was a young man named Peter Fagan who knew how to fingerspell. And he assisted with some things in the household. He was a friend of John Macy's um, 
and that that's how they introduce them to each other. And um, it is when Annie was in Puerto Rico thinking she was dying that Aunt Helen Keller and Peter Fagan um, became engaged and fell in love. The engagement hit the newspapers. Now this is at the height of eugenics. Um, there were many states in the United States that were actually literally the state legislators were discussing bills that would make it illegal for deaf and blind people to marry. Um, and there's this assumption that blind women should not and could not marry. The, the news of the engagement hit. Um, Keller's family was furious. Um, we don't know a lot of the details, but they basically spirited her away in the night to Alabama to get her away from um, Peter Fagan. He went down to Alabama and actually somehow snuck in some notes in Braille to Keller through some servants um, and was chased away with a gun. Again, right? this is like a soap opera. Um, and Keller wrote about that later in her life. Not about that. She wrote about how she would like to be in love. She never talked about Peter Fagan publicly. Uh, just a comment for Mary, Mary Ellen that I want to share. Uh, Mary, Mary Ellen is watching with her mother, Mary Ann, tonight. Um, and uh, Mary Ann actually met Helen uh, with her second companion in Springfield uh, near Agawam. And this was after Anne died. And that leads us into a question from DL, who, uh, and that goes back to your fact that she passed away in the 60s and it's not too far too long ago. Uh, but DL asks, how did Helen Keller continue to live without Anne Sullivan after Anne died? Did she hire other aides? Yeah, um, even in the night, I think it's in the early 20, 1920s, during one of their visits, to, the two women's visits to Scotland, they actually hired a woman, a Scottish woman named Polly Thompson, who was a sort of a friend of a friend, um, to help them with household activities. And as Anne's health deteriorated, Polly Thompson um, learned to fingerspell and took over increasing amounts of Anne's responsibilities. And I said that Helen was Annie's aide the last 10 years. Um, and I really think that was the case. Um, but Polly Thompson became more and more important to the household and began to serve um, as Helen Keller's assistant in public life and traveled with them. Um, and she remained um, with Helen long after Annie's death for about another 10 years, I think, and then, or excuse me, until about 10 years before Helen's death. And then um, various people also stepped in to help with the household. Um, but Polly Thompson was also very important, um, was considered a friend of both Annie and Helen. And, you know, um, I, I think was, um, like I said, a real good friend of both women. And she saw Annie's health you know, really decline and was important in the household then. Uh, Janice asks, how accurate do you think the film The Miracle Worker was? You know, it's really good drama. Um, I think particularly the scenes in Tuscumbia, Alabama, um, you know, it is, it's good drama to play up the sort of animalistic nature of the young Helen and the food fights around the table and the pinching and the screaming and the hair pulling. Um, it's, I, I think that was exaggerated. And I think certainly the, if any of you have seen the play, I actually saw, they, they've performed the play every summer in Tuscumbia on the grounds of the Keller household. And um, I was really, I went to watch it there and I was really struck because once, there are scenes in which Keller and the young Annie have this food fight once Annie first came down. And what really struck me is that the children in the audience thought that was hilarious. They loved the food fight. Um, and their parents were all horrified and trying to get them not to laugh. But I, you know, I think there's certain things that are played up for drama. Um, there's also a lot of evidence that before Ann Sullivan Macy came to Tuscumbia, that Keller had many home signs basically the hand signs that she had, her family had made up to talk to one another, to communicate one another. Um, hand signs about food, hand signs about people's names. Um, and so I think, you know, the miracle worker really 
portrays this magic moment at the water pump when all of a sudden language came to the young Helen. Um, but we do know that she had language before then um, and language that she and her family had developed. Um, so I think, you know, it's, it's, it is over melodramatic, um, but it is good drama. Uh, Joe asks, what was the most surprising thing about Anne you discovered in your research? That's a great question. I had no idea of who she was as a person in terms of her childhood traumas. And that really struck me. And, you know, honestly, I also had no idea that she was disabled, even though yeah, somehow I was like everyone else. I knew she'd gone to Perkins, but I had not made that obvious intellectual jump um, until I really began thinking about her as an individual and not just Helen Keller's teacher. Um, what do I, I, one of the funnest things I had to do in this book in preparation for the book, and I actually wrote like 30 pages on this and my editor told me it was boring. So I had to take it out. But um, Annie left at some point, a list of all the books she read while she was at Tewksbury. And they were, and it's close, she read some of them and some of them that other women read to her. And they were basically the trashy novels of the 1870s. Um, and trashy romances, trashy mysteries. And I spent an entire summer reading through that whole list. <laughs> and um, like I said, I, I wrote about all these books. And um, it was really fun for me to think, yeah, this is all frankly really bad literature, but I can just imagine Annie as a young teenager, right, 12, 10, 14 years old in Tewksbury, um, lonely, you know, all alone, but yet with this community of women who told her stories and how they would sit around and read each other these trashy novels. And I, I love that image of, despite how awful I think Tewksbury was, I love that image of this group of women caring for one another by reading these stories to one another and how literature, I think, saved her. Yeah. Right? Gave her an imagination, gave her stories to think about, um, gave her drama to keep, right? I don't know about you, but when I was 12, 13, 14, oh, I love big drama. And um, I, I just love that image of, of books as such as a saving grace, um, a community, and it doesn't even have to be good literature, right? It can be really bad literature, but the books saved her. We, we had Jennifer Arnott on Zoom uh, last night. She's a librarian over at the Perkins School for the Blind, and she shared with us a partial list of some of the books that um, uh, Anne uh, read while at Perkins. So yeah, voracious reader and reader of all sorts of books. Yes. Uh, so Joe has another sort of deep follow-up question. He would like to know, what would you ask Anne if you had the chance to do so? Uh. I would like to ask a, a personal question. I would really love to know about um, her, more about her relationship with John Macy and what happened there um, and why, you know, why both, it took him a year and a half to convince her to marry him. And then she never, you know, she never divorced him. So I'd like to ask that nosy personal question. I'd also like to ask her more about when what she and Helen did when they disagreed about the big things like politics and religion. Um, what did they do? How did they resolve that? Or did they argue? So speaking of Helen and John, uh, I'm gonna try to combine some questions, uh, but an anonymous attendee wants to know if you think Helen was jealous of John. Uh, Rick asks, do you think that John was annoyed with Helen having such a presence in his wife's life? And uh, if I'm not mistaken, Wendy also asks, um, uh, what attracted, uh, where am I here? Uh, da, 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 da. What attracted her to John Macy to begin with if he found her so objectionable? And why did Macy respect Mrs. Howe and her activities, but not women as a whole for, ru for ruining society? Yeah. So I just threw a lot at you there, Kim. I'm trying yeah. to condense the questions as we wind down yeah. here. 
Well, I often try and think about what would this be for a newly married couple to have another adult female living in the household who was so intimately engaged in the household activities. Um, and clearly, I think particularly when Helen became the primary moneymaker in the household and John's career tanked, um, that must have been very difficult for John. Yeah, it must have been very difficult for John. I think that the three, there were moments where the three of them were very happy living together, but clearly it went downhill fast. Um, and I think John must have been angry about the way that their, you know, Helen and somewhat Annie's careers were succeeding. His was not. Um, they were making money and he was not. They were getting attention. He was not. He wanted to be the next great journalist and literary star of the nation. That did not happen. Um, you know, I, I think he clearly became very angry. I think at first he was really attracted to Annie's wit, to her intellect, um, to her own interest in, in books, which he loved. Um, but that, you know, didn't, didn't go very well. There's, you know, there's so much speculation about the relationship between the three of them and what that meant. Um, I think it was a difficult relationship. Sure. I'm also going to uh, say that that question, uh, that, that answered a couple of other questions that were asked. Um, so we're going to wind down, take, take a few more questions, folks. Uh, Wendy asks, who was uh, her benefactor for the surgeries she had while at the Alms House? And why and how did she wind up going from Agawam to Tuxbury? Um. My understanding is it's largely um, two things, the State Board of Charities for the state of Massachusetts. And then there was a Catholic order of nuns, which the name of which is not gonna come out to my head, but who paid for um, a couple of the surgeries and provided her hospital care while she was at Tewksbury. Um, and how she got from Agawam to, to Tewksbury, um, literally her father took her in a carriage, but um, that's not what was asked. Um, my understanding is that he, her father looked around. There was not an almshouse close by. Um, they were ne relatively near there, staying with some of his family at the time. And he just showed up at the doorway with two of his three kids and dropped them off. It must have been awful. Uh, uh, Eva, uh, Eva uh, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. Eva asks, uh, did anyone interview uh, any of the African Americans uh, on the Keller farm? who were there before Annie arrived, did they teach her signs? I don't know of anyone who's interviewed them. Um, there are people who've done some census work and other historical scholarship on the, um, the servants, some of them former slaves who worked in the Keller household. Um, Keller wrote sort of problematically in many cases about those um, African-Americans who worked in her family's household. Um, there's, she clearly learned that they were there to take care of her as a child. And um, there's some evidence that what she wasn't always a well-behaved child towards the people around her. Can I put it that way? Um, and you know, my article in the Journal of Southern History talks about this directly. I think, you know, Keller later in adulthood um, wrote about the racism she saw as a child and, but also at the same time had really rosy glasses um, about Southern life. And um, there's a point where Keller read Gone with the Wind and just raved about how wonderful it was, um, you know, which now we look at its racist depiction um, and Keller didn't catch on that as when it was published. Um, but it is, you know, interesting. There were, we know, lynchings in the county where Keller lived during her childhood. Um, her father was the editor of a local newspaper and never wrote about them, though clearly he would have known about them. Um, and, you know, we don't know anything about his involvement there. Um, but the Keller family and Keller herself certainly benefited from slavery and from the forced labor of others and from the um, the remnants of the continued racism and the remnants of slavery that helped her, helped her family's economics. 
Uh, Paul seems to indicate that Annie um, was friends or friendly or an acquaintance of Mark Twain. Uh, can you talk a little bit about their relationship? And I guess it was, might have been Mark Twain who referred to Annie uh, as a miracle worker. Mm, that could be. Um, yeah, the, Twain was a, co a frequent correspondence between um, Annie and Helen, and they met several times. And, um, you know, he, I think he and Annie would have gotten along quite a bit. They had a little bit of the same sense of humor and sarcasm um, and irreverency. Um, and, but, you know, Twain was certainly someone who was interested in what was going on at the nation and just interesting things in the nation and politics. Um, and yeah, they met, they corresponded um, and corresponded for several, my, my memory is more than a decade. Sure. A uh, final question goes to Karen, which I think is an appropriate question to end on. I think uh, you've done uh, so much uh, through your works to, um, to really shed light on um, Annie's contributions. But uh, Karen is sort of asking in the moment uh, during her time, uh, she asks, was Anne as respected for her ability to teach Helen um, as she became more, more well known, or was she just considered an interpreter or caretaker? I don't so think that, qu yeah, yeah the question was never settled during her yeah. life. Um, there was a point near the end of Ansel and Macy's life where Temple University gave her an honorary PhD for her teaching of Keller. And um, at the last minute, Annie decided not to show up. She, she stood in the back incognito. Um, not sure if she deserved it, but also very honored. Um, so there were folks who during her time were really respected for her, for her ability to teach um, and there were others who really dismissed her and continued to dismiss Keller, um, gave the credit to others, or simply believed that, you know, no one taught Keller and it was all a fake. Um, so uh, I would encourage folks in the chat uh, to let uh, Kim know, drop a comment, let her know how much you enjoyed tonight's presentation. Uh, so Kim, uh, while we uh, are about to uh, end here, we've gone a little bit uh, over time. I appreciate your uh, flexibility and your generosity with your time. Uh, do you have any uh, last words you want to uh, share Gosh. with the group? I would really encourage you, for those interested, to go to the National Cathedral and see the um, burial spot of both women. There's a wonderful marker in Braille, and it's the most polished marker in the cathedral simply because so many people touch it. It's a really, it, it, it was very meaningful to me. Excellent, excellent. Um, let's see, I don't wanna get this wrong. I'm probably gonna manage to mess this up somehow, but uh, there is a uh, sculpture of uh, Anne and Helen uh, here in Tewksbury. Really? Uh, yes, it was uh, done, uh, commissioned by the, the famous uh, sculptor, Miko Kaufman, who's actually like legitimately a world renowned sculptor and he lived most of his life right here in Tewksbury. And um, uh, I wanna say there's one in uh, Tewksbury, England, and there's one here in Tewksbury, Massachusetts. And I, I believe, uh, I'm trying to see if I can look this up on another screen, but I believe that uh, it's, uh, I, I believe there's one in front of the town hall, and I believe there's one on the grounds of the Tewksbury Hospital. Um, so um, it's certainly not, uh, I'm sure, uh, national monument uh, worthy, but, uh, but it, is, it is quite a feat. And uh, I'll include more information in the email I send out tomorrow. Ho hopefully I got most of that correct. All right, so Kim, I wanna thank you so, so much for your wonderful presentation and for answering like 20 questions for us. That was wonderful. Uh, I wanna thank the libraries in Lowell, Groveland, Clinton, Middleton, Newburyport, Andover, North Andover and Tingsboro for partnering with Tewksbury. I wanna to thank the friends of the Tewksbury Public Library for being the primary sponsor. I wanna thank the Public Health Museum here in Tewksbury, uh, as well as the uh, Mass Center for the Book for all their uh, publicity uh, assistance. And uh, I wanna most importantly thank the audience. Great turnout. There were over 80 of you, I think nearly 90 of you at one point. Uh, look for that email tomorrow, link to a feedback survey, link to a recording, and information about tomorrow night's talk. So hope to see you all tomorrow night if you're free. Thanks so much, Kim. Good night. Thanks to all of you. Bye-bye.